in the end, it's just an American heritage. And these are all pieces of that American heritage. On those special months, we shine the spotlight on people and events that essentially history books have forgotten. Without these months, those stories would be lost or you'd have to really dig pretty deep to find them. As the first uh, Asian American and Hispanic Article III judge in Pennsylvania and as the first South Asian uh, female judge in the United States, federal judge in the United States, uh, it has been the honor of my life to really hold those roles and to have carved a path for others like me who look like me and who who might have grown up in a similar situation to me. So that's really been meaningful to me. Now it has also been striking to me that it took so long to get here and to make that progress. There's always a tremendous amount of pressure because I've always felt like people are waiting for me to mess up. <laughs> and so I think the reality is if you are a first of anything, whether you're the first kid to go to college, you're the first person to have attended law school or, or gone to a particular law school, I think people are always watching, or at least we feel their eyes on us, whether they are or they aren't. And so we bring with us that baggage when we are first. My mother is uh, from Trinidad. She's of East Indian descent. Uh, she came here, came to the United States, came to New York City in particular in the 60s, and met my father, who was a Puerto Rican tradesman. My father died when I was really young, and uh, my mom met another wonderful man who would become my stepfather, who also was East Indian from Trinidad. And so uh, I grew up in a very ethnic household. I don't think I really knew it at the time, but we were I think we would be characterized as poor. <laughs> uh, we did not have a lot of money, but they were big believers in the American dream, uh, big believers in working hard to get what you get, and that was pretty instilled in me. It's a loving house, but you know what we didn't have in luxuries, we made up for in hard work and perseverance. <laughs> There were so many teachers uh, throughout my time, whether it be in elementary school, you know, the first teacher who really recognizes that you're reading at a, a level beyond others, or the first teacher who recognizes that, hey, you're gonna go to college. You, you may be one of those people who go to college, because that's not a given the way I grew up. Those are the people who really changed the trajectory of my life, and those are the people who are the reason I sit here. I recognized early on that my parents didn't have money to send me to college, so I knew that I would have to work for it. I'd have to get scholarships, and in order to get scholarships, you have to do well. I never knew a world outside of my own world other than television, and so I saw, you know, people going to college on TV and becoming professionals on TV, becoming lawyers. I'd never had exposure to a lawyer before. I only saw them on TV. And that was when I realized that's something that seems interesting to me. That's something that I think I can do. My whole exposure to the world of law was born out of things from Perry Mason to Night Court. And so, you know, seeing those people on TV having those roles, I thought to myself, well, if I can make it to college, then maybe I can make it to law school. If I can make it to law school, maybe I can become one of those people that I see on TV and maybe someday I can live in a house like this and someday I could have, uh, you know, the things that they have. So the, those, that, at least early on, was my motivator. One of the things that I realized early on in my life is that I could write. I knew how to write and I knew how to speak. I realized that I could hold my end of an argument <laughs> early on. Certainly, that skill set, the combination of being able to write and communicate and argue, all seemed like a natural fit as far as a lawyer was concerned, or what at least what I thought a lawyer was. I think what I enjoy most about being a judge is being a problem solver. 
I think that when a case goes to trial or is ultimately resolved, it's almost like I feel like I've failed in some way because I feel like there are so many other ways to resolve cases. And I love bringing the parties together to try to come up with those types of solutions that are short of a trial, short of a judgment. Uh, only because, you know, when you have litigation that goes to trial or goes to a judgment, there's a winner and a loser there, you know, as opposed to something in between there where there can be compromise and there can be solutions that the litigation process may not even bring you. And, you know, I've had cases where someone just really wants an apology, you know, let's sit down and let's talk about that. You know, let's not go to trial because you know what? You're never going to get an apology in a trial. <laughs> I mean, you, you may win, you may lose, but there's not going to be the apology that you want. My background is such that if you were taking bets, I would imagine you wouldn't have bet on me being here, being in this room. And so what I always tell young people is that there are other paths to the bench beyond money, beyond connections, and that working hard was my path. And if they do that, they can really direct where their future leads them. And I think that that is a legitimate path, and I think some people may disagree with me, but I am a living example of that.